thank you once again for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to spend it here in the spirit of community, mentorship, and learning. I'm your host, Dave Nava. I'm a lead solution engineer at Salesforce, and I'm a military trailblazer. Each week, we invite a co-host or co-hosts to take part in the conversation so that we can leverage their experience, their expertise, and their unique perspectives. I would like to welcome our co-host for tonight's session, David Giller. David's a thought leader in the Salesforce ecosystem and is affectionately known as the Salesforce geek. He's a former attorney turned Salesforce trainer and consultant, and he's the founder and CEO of Brainiate, which helps organizations and their users best leverage the power of the Salesforce platform to transform their business processes and improve their productivity. He's also spent over eight years as GE Capital's Salesforce guru in the past as their administrator, developing deep experience on the Salesforce platform. It is awesome to have you co-hosting office hours with me, David. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Would you like to take a moment and uh, further introduce yourself and kind of share your Salesforce story? Uh, sure. I am a complete accidental admin, which I know many of you are, even though the what I'll refer to as the newer generation of folks entering the Salesforce ecosystem are fewer and fewer accidental admins. It's more folks who are proactively pursuing a career in Salesforce. On paper, I was a philosophy major and now I'm an attorney. And how on earth I ended up doing what, what I'm doing today is between me and my therapist. Uh, it, it, it's been a, a bizarre, unexpected, unplanned twists and turns in my insane career. But honestly, I am, I am I'm thrilled. I love what I do. I often tell people that um, what 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 energizes me in helping people on the Salesforce platform today is the exact same thing that that interested me in pursuing a career in law initially when I was 1920, uh, which is helping to solve problems. A lawyer solves problems by using the legal system as their toolkit. I solve problems for people and for companies by using the Salesforce platform as my toolkit. Um, and so. I, I let, when I left GE Capital, I opened up my own Salesforce consulting business, uh, as David Nava mentioned, Brainiate, and I work with many companies across uh, all different kinds of industries and all different sizes, from small little startups to large enterprise organizations, helping them with all sorts of Salesforce-related problems and projects. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. I'll shut up now because I could ramble forever. I could talk to a doorknob. <laughs> so <laughs> David, it's all yours. Best co-host ever. Uh, <clears throat> no, thanks very much for sharing your story. That's awesome. Um, I do see some new faces on the on the call tonight, which is awesome as well. So for those joining for the first time, uh, I always like to explain kind of what these sessions are about. And essentially, they're an informal get together for gathering with military trailblazers as well as allies to explore non-technical Salesforce career and branding related topics in order to help you achieve your professional development and career related goals. So with that in mind, the next hour is intended to be an opportunity for collaborative mentorship. Everyone on the call is encouraged to step up and help answer questions from your perspective, participate in the dialogue, which will of course provide additional diversity of experience to the answers given. Just gonna let some folks in here, here we go. Um, please keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. Typically what I will do throughout the week is I'll gather articles on LinkedIn and other sources that are really interesting um, and I'll post those in chat so you can check them out. Other folks do that as well. If you haven't guessed yet, uh, the focus for tonight's session is exploring the Salesforce admin role to include guidance and best practices for how to be an effective admin. If you wanna ask questions at any point during today's session, please feel free to do so. This is your session. If you don't feel comfortable speaking up, you can post your questions in chat and I will also be looking for raised hands. So as you guys and gals know, I usually have a whole list of questions, but I like to give you the floor first. So with that in mind, who would like to ask the first question? All right, I heard a blip. Let me just check here. Uh, Nick, you've got a question. You have the floor, sir. Awesome. Thanks, both of you. David, as always, thanks for holding, hosting this. Other David, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, so a lot of us here, like, we've had experience in the military community, and a lot of people poise the idea, like, I like to solve problems. I like to lead teams. Um, I like to help people. Probably everybody here wants to do those three things in some way, shape, or fashion. How do you, I'm one of those people too, right? How do you kind of like drill down on that and to find a focus area, I think, because it's very broad and it's good to know those things, but what would be your advice to somebody who 
wants to do those things, but isn't necessarily sure which direction to take it in? It's a great question. Um, I would say think of it, you could think of this in a lot of different ways. I'm gonna, I like to simplify things because <laughs> my own brain needs to simplify things to the lowest common denominator in order to process it well. So what I'll say is choose either what ignites your passion, your interest, uh, or what you see as being a real gap within the Salesforce ecosystem. So you might be tremendously interested in, I'm going to choose something completely random, the adoption of dogs. So you might say, you know what? I want to see whether or not there are any nonprofits that are, or maybe uh, veter, uh, uh, veterinarian offices that are using Salesforce or want to use Salesforce and identify some use cases and things like that, where you can start proactively pursuing something like that and develop this niche expertise on how to track different dog breeds and adoption inquiries and, and how long it takes from the time someone inquires about adopting a dog until they actually adopt the dog. So you can, you can just out of the blue identify, here's what gets me really excited and pursue that. That's one way of identifying like a real match between what excites you and what keeps you busy during the day to help you pay your bills, hopefully, so you end up loving your job. Um, or the other option that I mentioned, which is identifying what the gap is in the Salesforce ecosystem. And hopefully you can find a way that that aligns with uh, a particular area of expertise and or passion that you have and pursue it. And for that one, I'm going to give a perfect a perfect example for myself. Uh, one of the things that I actually I, I did not mention, but I'm well known for in the Salesforce ecosystem is uh, associated with training, both end user training as well as admin training. There are many times that some large global companies, uh, uh, they leverage a different one of my competitors, a different consulting company to actually customize and implement roll out Salesforce but that consulting company, uh, either they put their hands up in the air and say, yeah, end user training, we'd rather not, or that's not included, or for, or for some reason, the, the customer, the company themselves, they're like, can you get David Gillard to do that end user training? Like, it's great that you did all this. Can you get David Gillard to do the end user training? So a lot of times I am, uh, um, I am approached by companies that either by the consulting firm uh, or by the company just to do end user training. So that's something that I do both for end users as well as for admins. Sometimes it's like a large global company that'll say, look, we've got like 15 to 30 people who are in IT. None of them know anything about Salesforce. We need to get them upskilled and we need to teach them Salesforce. So that's something that I do. I spend a lot of time doing that. It's a big part of my business. And uh, let me rewind a little bit. When I was back in GE Capital and I was involved in the initial rollout and I was on a very, very small team of people responsible for Salesforce across 10 different sub-businesses, 2,000 end users. And one day my boss turns to me. I will never forget this. One day my boss turns to me and she says, David, you know how your colleague, I'm not going to name her, your colleague uh, is responsible for doing the end user training of Salesforce for all of our 2,000 users across 10 different sub-businesses? I'm like, yeah. And you know how she's taking on a new job and she's leaving soon? Yeah. And you know how I don't really have headcount to replace her? I'm like, uh, okay. Well, I need you to take on her responsibilities in addition to everything else that you're doing. I exploded on her. I totally, steam was coming out of my ears. My face went red. I'm like, what on earth makes you think that I have any interest? in doing end user training. Are you are like you're like taking me like 30 steps backwards in my career. Do you realize that I'm a freaking I'm an attorney? Do you realize that I did the actual rollout and configurate? You want me to do end user training? I'm gonna be the punching bag of every single sales rep that we have. They're not gonna make time for me. They're gonna blame me all of the data quality issues, all of the uh, lack of user engagement issues, la lack of user adoption issues are all gonna be blamed me because the, and you, the the sales reps are going to say, yeah, that Giller guy, he either talks too fast or I didn't understand him or he wasn't available to answer my question. 
I don't want to do that. And she looked at me. We had like a mother-son relationship. She, she looked at me, arms folded, just waiting for me to blow over. And she's like, I know. I still need you to do it. <laughs> and I took it on uh, in, in spite of the fact that I really did not want to. And while I took it on, I actually realized that there was a major gap in the Salesforce ecosystem in general when it comes to end user training. And usually, more often than not, the people who are involved in doing the business requirements gathering and the configuration and the project management to introduce enhancements in Salesforce, usually those people stereotypically are not the kind of personalities of folks who are comfortable getting at the front of a room and speaking or teaching people on how to use it in a way that the non-technical business user understands. And I guess part of it is my background and part of it is the fact that I'm not technical and part of it, the fact that like, I couldn't care less about doing public speaking. Like I'm not seeking out those public speaking opportunities, but I'm totally comfortable being at the front of the room and everyone's staring at me. Uh, so I teach it in a way that is relevant for them. I'm not teaching it to them saying, you see this button over here? Let me show you what this button does. Nobody gives a damn about a button. A sales rep wants to know. How do I find my customers and prospects? How do I update the customers and prospects? How do I find all of those customers and prospects or deals that require attention? So putting it within that perspective makes it super exciting for them. So I have come around full circle from hating everything about doing training to completely embracing it and loving it. And that's a major focus of what I do as a business of training. And I'm not doing it uh, under duress. I'm, I'm doing it voluntarily and completely loving it. So that's where, th that's a perfect example. Like the only reason why I'm focusing on that is because there's a huge need. And I think the need is so big that if every single one of you decided that from now forward, you're going to focus your careers on the exact same thing, I am not concerned from a competitive perspective whatsoever. There is so much of a need that it would be a wonderful thing for the Salesforce community if all of you decided you all wanted to be training experts on the Salesforce platform. So that, that was answering in a very long way. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. Can I add a comment here? Sure. Absolutely. David, David? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, David. That was a really excellent story and a lesson uh, that to remind us, you know, the things that we say no to. Initially, we just have to give it a try because you might end up not liking it at all. And it's the same lesson I teach my kids when I tell them you have to try this food or this activity because you never know and you have to try it more than once. For food, they said it at least 10 times. But the other thing that I wanted to point out with training, I actually volunteered to do training for my consulting firm and I'm new at Salesforce. And to me, a big factor in doing that is because I learn faster when I teach other people. Yep. So that's another benefit with doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. One, one of the things that, that, I, that, I, that I started doing a while back was to mentor folks because I found that as a mentor, I was actually teaching my, reteaching myself skills uh, that are essential to have. Um, it's a great point there. Does anybody else have a question for David? And if not, I have plenty. I got one. Okay. This is Ron. How are you doing? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, training is something that's grossly overlooked. Uh, it's almost like an afterthought. Yeah. Uh, and 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 some some people out there think that anybody can be a trainer. Well, if you can be all day on your feet and take uh, some challenging questions and really do the homework, because students will immediately pick up on any hesitation or any kind of uh, lack of confidence or lack of knowledge that you might have. That's why trainers really need to be you know on the ball. So. Yeah, that's that. So on the one hand, that is 100% absolutely true. On the other hand, for those of you who are considering and hopefully I'm, I've inspired some of you to explore training as a career path. Uh, you don't have to feel compelled that you need to know the answer to everything you don't don't worry so much about imposter syndrome. You definitely need to know those things that are coming out of your mouth, you, you need to know them, you need to understand them. However, when it comes to being 
a trainer, an instructor, those of you who are parents, even in your role as a parent, you really just need to be one or two pages ahead of the people that you're, you are training. It's completely okay to flat out say, I don't know the answer to that question, but I will find out for you and I will get back to you on it. And one of the things I learned early on, and actually this was uh, as it relates to when I first started doing Salesforce training, this is before the, uh, several years prior to the conversation that I mentioned earlier with my manager, where she said, you're gonna own it, you're gonna own everything. Uh, when I had to train the end users that I, I just did the implementation for, and it was that or the colleague that I mentioned who put together the presentation, I was terrified of being at the front of the room teaching this content because I did not know anything beyond what, was, what she prepared for me in the PowerPoints. I was terrified of any question that was going to come my way. And my that same woman manager who I reported to later on, she turned to me and she basically said, don't worry about it. You just have a flip chart open, big open or big whiteboard in the room, whatever it is, super prominent for everyone to see. And before you get started, you write on the top in big letters, parking lot. If anyone asks any question that you don't know the answer to, you immediately go with the marker and you put it on the parking lot and you basically tell them, listen, I will have to follow up with you on that question. We have an insanely jam-packed agenda right now. And the only way to get through it is by making sure that we stay on target. So I'm putting it over there and I'm going to list out your question so you recognize I am not forgetting about it. I'm going to also put your name and I will find out afterwards. I will follow up with you. And if everyone wants, I will share with all of you the answers uh, after I get the, uh, I identify them myself for those questions. So that's okay too. Awesome. We've got, uh, Elia, I see your hand raised and we'll get to that in one second. David, we've got a question in chat um, and it's um, from, let's see, Cesar. Um, what are the benefits of enabling territory management in Salesforce? I don't know if you've had the opportunity to work with that. I have, um, but it was long ago. I am looking for that question. I can't find it, but uh, where, why don't I see it? Uh, whatever, it's all good. Um, territory management. So this is one of those areas where for sure Salesforce had good intentions. <laughs> but yeah. it, so there, especially when it comes to, I mean, there are many areas where Salesforce had good intentions, but the actual uh, deployment of that functionality is a little bit, little bit wonky. With territory management in particular, if the data quality is not 100%, you're screwed. If the company later decides, and every company does, that we're going to redefine the regions, we're going to redefine territories. I've had, I've worked with organizations, particularly in the home healthcare industries, especially in the New York City area, where they redefine what they mean by Midtown Manhattan. They start defining it by street and avenue. So usually when any organization initially says, oh, let's explore territory management, usually the business requirements seem incredibly straightforward, very black and white, no question about it. They will swear up and down that the requirements are never going to change. But inevitably, they do. And then the question becomes, as it relates to territory manage the territory management configuration and what data you are relying on to define the territory, let alone is anyone actually populating it, and how the internal definitions could change. There are, in a nutshell, a lot of moving, tar moving pieces uh, to everything associated with territory management. Let alone you're also going to have situations where Joe, Joe is responsible for the East Coast. Oh, however, because he has a special relationship with these other companies that are located outside of the East Coast, we need to make exceptions for those too. Every organization has stuff like that. So yeah. I create when well, someone says they want to they want to implement territory management. And it really it, it has less to do with the Salesforce functionality and learning how to enable it and more to do with the overall experience. One of those things you definitely want to put some planning time into beforehand before your fingers start hitting keys with the configuration. Yep. All right. We've got a couple of hands raised. Uh, Elio, you're first, and then Megan will get to your question. Awesome. David, always an honor to be in your presence, and thank you for thank sharing you. today. 
Sure. I, I know you made a left turn from being an attorney to going into the Salesforce world and becoming this awesome uh, resource, MVP and what have you. And I see your marketing is everywhere. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I always talk with uh, veterans about making sure you understand how to market your brand and what you're trying to get to. Like, what's the point first? And then also, if you can share some of those marketing tips. I always get a kick out of a lot of your posts because they're very personal, even right. though we haven't talked in like six years. <laughs> yeah. Right. I always feel like you, you're, your your message is resonating so i just wanted to ask you that yep thank you it's it's a great question it's something that most people don't think about as it relates to managing their own career so everything i'm about to say holds true whether you are running a business like i am or if it's just being a full-time employee uh, your goal is to always be a full-time employee until it comes time for retirement which is personal branding and why is person what is personal branding why uh, why is it important and how to go about uh, building and, and executing on your personal brand so at the time when i first started immersing myself in everything associated with personal brand the the term personal brand meant nothing to me i had no idea what that meant i was simply looking for a job i was looking for a better job i felt uh i was at I was a GE for a total of over 16 years. I was a GE Capital for about eight of those 16 years. I was at NBC, which later became NBC Universal beforehand. And while I was at GE, and on, on the one hand, it was a phenomenal experience for me. I learned a ton. Many of my former colleagues have become either clients or referral sources for me. But while I was there, while I was at both NBC and GE Capital, I was uh, working hard. I was responsible for very, very large projects, very visible projects. And I kept watching other people getting promoted all around me. I felt like I was being left in the dust. I felt like I was stuck in whatever job my manager needed me to be in because my manager did not have someone else who was going to take on all of that work and i felt that i was sort of like in a prison of some kind where like i could i couldn't move the only way to move was to totally leave ge entirely yet my my network and my expertise let alone the terminology and culture of ge was i was already embraced in all of it so my interest in personal branding really came from an interest in trying to find a job because uh, I was so insanely frustrated with my experience as an employee at GE for so many years. And um, as I was looking, as I was exploring best practices on job hunting, that's where I, I completely stumbled on the concept of personal branding. And for those of you who know who Lewis Howes is, He's the one who taught me pretty much everything that I know about personal branding. He's like a social media, like influencer type of a podcast and YouTube channel and huge following. Um, at the time, this is like 2008, he was pretty much a nobody, but he happened to have a whole bunch of videos on LinkedIn, uh, basically teaching how to build your personal brand specifically on LinkedIn. And I learned so much from, from him when he was, he was like a nobody. It was like a freaking raw camcorder, uh, or webcam just on his face. So terrible lighting and everything. And, uh, basically what I learned is that there are, whether you're looking for a job or you're starting a business, you could be the one who's trying hunting, running after the people you are trying to impress and trying to convince them to think like you to consider here's my resume take a look at my resume you know here take uh, let me here's my job application where i i want to pursue that open job that you have uh, here's the product or service that i'm offering here buy from me so you could either take that approach we all know as consumers how painful it is when people that we don't know and we don't care about are approaching us about things that 
we just don't care. We're not interested in. We know how, we perceive it as spam, whether it comes in the form of a phone call, an email, an in-person. Uh, you know, you walk, the stereotypical, you walk into a mall and you happen to walk near the, the cosmetic stuff and they're spraying you with everything like, get the hell away from me. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to go from point A to point B. Uh, so that's one way to do it. And it could be super frustrating. And that's how most people pursue their career or building a, building a, a business, or you could take an entirely different approach, um, which is demonstrate to the world, well, first you need to define who is your target audience. It's really not the world. Dem uh, identify who is your target audience. What is it that you want to be known for? What area of expertise do you want to put out there? What are your passions and interests? What sets you apart from everybody else? And essentially wear that on your sleeve. And do it in a way where you are out there not saying, hey, hire me. Hey, look at my resume. You're basically putting yourself out there. And with social media, it becomes so freaking easy to do it on any social media platform, let alone in any in Salesforce, putting it within the Salesforce context, any Salesforce user group meetup or Zoom meeting like this one, uh, or even at a Dreamforce, by simply sharing the knowledge and expertise and passion that you happen to have, sh demonstrating how you could be of value to other people based on the knowledge and information that you have. So instead of being the one who's, uh, you know, like I, I, I gave you the description before, uh, Watching, you're, you're the employee at the cosmetics counter in the mall and watching for the next body to come by so you can spray them with perfume. Instead, you're like the person standing, that, that old person who's standing at the uh, in Costco at the, at the beginning of the aisle with a bunch of uh, awesome smelling uh, samples and people are lining up because they want that sample. You're not running after them. They're coming to you and they're coming back for seconds. And they're like, wow, this was really good. And if I got this for free and it was so impressive, I can't imagine what I would get if I actually reached into my pocket and swipe my credit card to get the full product. So you're basically giving the equivalent of samples, uh, but really good samples of what's you, the value that you bring to the table uh, in order to get people to come to you. So uh, I've... I've Im immersed myself in everything around personal brand branding, and it's a long game. It's the equivalent of, it's not the equivalent of sending out job applications or talking to a recruiter and waiting a couple of days to get a response. Mm -mm. This is the equivalent of planting seeds and putting down the soil and watering it once a day and waiting for the sun to shine on it. And hopefully after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, things are going to sprout. And then hopefully you're going to reap the re rewards of having the fruit come and it's all yours you're no longer running to the supermarket to go buy stuff it's it's right there so it, it's a long haul game and you need so you need to be consistent about it um and most people think that personal branding is all about calling attention to yourself as in oh look at me look at how awesome i am look at how brilliant i am it's not about that at all it's all about showing how you demonstrate value to your audience so i try with all of my online communications, uh, email communications, in-person communications, to frame it not as, oh, here's the expertise that I have. Big freaking deal. Anyone can, can overshadow me with the number of certifications, the number of years of experience that they have, the type of the size of the projects that they've worked on. But what I am calling out is, here's this piece of information, even like Here's an article that was written by someone else. It's not even my article. I might not know anything on this topic, but here is this awesome article that someone else wrote. And here, let me share it with you because you might find this valuable. So it's doing that consistently along with your own knowledge and expertise that you bring to the table and being authentic about it like not candy coat, because people can see through that. If you're trying to candy coat things, if like you're reading from a script, people can tell, they can tell. But if you're just being yourself, and when you don't know, say you don't know, be honest about it, it shines through and it totally stands out from everyone else that you're competing against, which includes other job applicants that you're competing against. I love that analogy between the perfume sprayer at the mall and the uh, the person with the, del the delicious samples at Costco, because <laughs> that perfectly illustrates, you know, exactly the difference. 
between folks that have content that no one wants and therefore their brand is weak and folks that have content that's valuable and therefore their brand is strong. Awesome. Um, Megan has had her hand raised for a while. Megan, we're going to jump to you in just one second. We're at the halfway point, so I want to grab a quick picture before we do that. And so uh, totally optional, but if everyone who wants to participate would like to unmute their video, we'll go ahead and grab a quick snap. Uh, and I'll share that on social media tomorrow, and you can feel free to reshare as you see fit. So I'll give you a second to get that set up. And... All right. And here we go on a count of three. Three, two, one. All right. I wasn't actually talking that time, so it actually came out. Good deal. Let me just go ahead and save that. All right, Megan, the floor is yours with your question. Hi, David. Hello. I'm just curious what some of your other favorite admin roles were in the past and maybe what you've kind of thought about for the future. I just want to pick your brain a little. So the way I see it in the real world, the, uh, the use of the label or job title of Salesforce admin is incredibly mushy. It's very subjective. In fact, most of the, the more successful Salesforce admins that I know, the word admin is not even in their job title. Uh, a lot of times the word Salesforce is not even in their job title. Uh, so very often they are very involved in, from a leadership perspective, when I say leadership, I mean more as a, like a thought leader within their organization. Uh, it could be from a technology perspective. It could be from a sales operations perspective, sales management perspective, marketing management perspective. Uh, it, it could be from a, 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 just a business requirements gathering perspective, uh, IT in general. So it can look like a lot of different things. This, uh, a Salesforce admin can, let's, let's say a, a large complex enterprise organization can be practically in any department of the organization, even, even in HR, they can be in freaking HR, but because they are so involved in what's going on within HR and managing the HR processes in Salesforce, they can absolutely be a Salesforce admin in HR, not even in IT. So um, from my perspective, what is most appealing is really the area that can solve the biggest problems that the organization is struggling with at the moment. And believe it or not, the, the cool, when I first decided that I was going to start uh, uh, my Salesforce consulting business. My, in my head, I was like, I'm going to take everything, all of these really crazy complex things that I did here at GE, and I'm just going to use that. That's going to be my stepping stone. I'm going to be building off of that to learn even cooler stuff and do even cooler stuff that like GE won't let me do or let us do as an organization here within GE. And that's still like, a wish list kind of thing, because also as a technology geek, like learning new features, implementing new features, implementing new products is always, that, that's a running theme. But most organizations, I don't care about size and I don't, the size of the organization, I don't care about the maturity of the, of the organization. It could be some very prominent logos that are globally like really impressive. And chances are, I'll even go so far to say that there's an 80 to 90% chance that the biggest struggles within those organizations is that their end users don't fully understand the difference between leads, contacts, accounts, opportunities, activities, campaigns. They don't know how to log phone calls. They don't know how to work with a list view. They don't know how to pull a report. Basics, fundamentals. And a lot of times I encounter organizations that where when they start rattling off all of the issues, all of the struggles that they have, usually they will articulate it as there are a lot of people who are not using Salesforce. The people are still using Excel no matter, uh, no matter how much we're trying to encourage them and force it. Like we're still dealing with that. Our reports suck. 
like trying to pull a mailing list in, in our organization is just it's terrible it's just not and i'm like what's so terrible about it like so if you were to go into reports and you go into accounts and uh accounts and contacts and you just try to pull a mailing list like what's wrong we well, have duplicates and a lot of times they'll say things like duplicates huh? we've got an, a custom object called volunteers, another one called parents, another one called doctors, another one called patients, another one called friends, and a person can be listed in all of those. So the issues have nothing to do with using the shiny new object that came out with the latest release. It has nothing to do with learning about new Salesforce features. It's the basics. People are struggling with the basics. And to me, even teaching them that, it's not about in my head, I don't see it as this is a project that is less exciting because it's just, we're just focusing on basics and getting rid of the clutter. I see it as insanely exciting because I'm solving a problem by basically doing nothing but teaching them the basics. And yeah, there's a lot of cleanup that goes along with that and getting rid of all of those custom objects and trying to resolve the duplicate records. Yeah, they're a huge, you know, there's a huge domino effect that goes along with that. But to me, that is an insanely exciting project. Um, and it's so basic and simple. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Awesome, thank you. We do have a question. Um, Phil would like to continue the discussion on branding. And he says, I really need an education on personal branding, especially how to generate helpful and authentic content to the target audience. Uh, other than this meeting, what is the best source for that? Was that, is that like a, is that like a trick question? Because I do have a course on personal branding for Salesforce admin. So like, I just want to know, is someone trying to pull my leg here with the, by asking that question or what? Um, hold on one second. I'm going to put a link in the chat to, to my course. Um, I was actually reluctant for a long time to even create this course because I felt like the material is out there. Like, it's not that unique to do personal branding as a Salesforce admin versus anything else. Uh, but at the same time, people struggle with trying to find the content. So I'm like, okay, I'll put together a course so people can benefit from it. So like, awesome. Um, so what I'll say is this, other than saying, okay, go, you know, you could certainly go to YouTube. You could certainly leverage my course. You could certainly, the local public library podcast, there are tons of podcasts on, on the topic. Um, Give, give me a more specific question and I'm happy to answer it regarding uh, leveraging, building out, distributing, refining your personal brand, anything along those lines and, you know, to make it, to make it more real. Uh, well, I can follow up. That was my question. Uh, no, it wasn't a setup. I honestly didn't know you had a course. It, <laughs> it's all, it's all just completely new to me. Uh, right. I'm far along in my career, but I've, it's never been important to me, personal branding. Yep. Yep. Same, same long time tucked away in a, you know, whatever it's, it's all brand new to me. So I'm, I'm looking for, uh, probably what's at the other side of this link, uh, a yep. well, a well-structured plan for going from zero to a, some degree of effectiveness. Yeah. And, and that is what I, uh, present throughout the course where most of it 90 percent of the course it's not it's not about like where to click and how to create a post and it has nothing to do with any of that it has to do with, you have to define for yourself like why why is it so these are similar to what's that book what color is your parachute i think the book is called where you sort of have to figure out like what is it that what do you want to be when you grow up uh and 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 why and what you know, like I mentioned before, like what excites you and what is it that you don't want to be doing or don't want to be associated with. And that by doing those things, what you're really doing is you're putting together the structure of the framework, your own internal definition, which will help you figure out what is the target message that I want to get out to that target audience? And where am I going to find that target audience? Maybe I'm not even connected to that target audience right now. Well, I need to go after them. I need to find them. I need to pursue them as so that they are within my network. I need to, I need to listen into what problems they are 
talking about so where do they congregate either in person or online where those questions might come up so let's say for example that you decide that you want to be a salesforce admin for uh i'll pick something totally different than anything i talked about previously let's say the healthcare industry um so you could just start by even in the trailblazer community what groups already exist that have to do with healthcare and where Salesforce admins might be uh, for the healthcare industry. You might also uh, look for just doing a Google search to see what else is out there, which might lead you to specific Twitter accounts. It might lead you to some specific podcasts or blog articles or products. And basically you're starting to build that list of here are the, here are the places where these people that I'm looking for might uh, congregate. Here are the types of topics that are often coming up, the topics that either I'm already familiar with or need to become familiar with so I can speak fluently to them and be in tune with what their challenges are. And if you, as you uncover, oh, I, I know what the, I know how to solve that issue. You need to start sharing it with people because nobody knows what's in your head. So you need to start putting yourself out there in terms of, and some of it might be, it could be something as rudimentary as someone posts a question in the Trailblazer community or on Reddit or in Twitter or on LinkedIn, and you happen to know the answer, or you know something that may or may not, it might lead them in the right direction. So you all you have to it's as simple as just commenting and sharing. Here's what I do know. What I do know is oh, this person might be able to help you. Or I found this blog to be helpful in the past when I've had similar issues. Or this app on the App Exchange might be helpful to you. And it starts with that, and people start to recognize, oh, who is that person? And let me look at their profile and let me see where they're at. And so you're building from there, and it's it starts really small, and and you're building from there to uh, to go further. And um, as you're doing that, people will start reaching out to you with questions. As you're doing that, different user groups are going to ask you, hey, are you available to come and present on that topic? Because you, you it looks like you know pretty consistently you've been posting some things. And even if it's only responses to other people's questions, uh, you happen to know a lot about this topic. Can you come and present to our Salesforce Saturday, our local user group, whatever it is? and before you know it, you're going to be asked to go to bigger and bigger stages. Uh, that's that's how it happens. Yeah. Thank Can you. I add something there? Sure. I think that was really encouraging because um, at this point in my journey, it's so easy to feel like such a small little minnow in a huge lake ocean. Um, and I just wonder if other people have been able to relate to, you know, a little bit of a scarcity mindset when it comes to success in the Salesforce ecosystem, just because when you get involved into these communities, um, it, it just seems like it really is hard to brand yourself and to stand out differently or um, maybe not differently, but um, just to brand yourself. So thank you for that insight. I think it was very encouraging. Yep. My pleasure. And honestly, just be yourself. Let your own personality and quirks and strengths as well as weaknesses, just let them come through. Each person is unique. Each person's perspective is unique. Each person's communication style is unique. And just let that come through. And that by itself will be your unique impression that you make on other people. It might even be just the way you formulate a question or respond to a question that ends up being unique. Look, a, a lot of people tell me this all the time, that the reason why they like asking me questions is because A, they know I'm not gonna candy coat anything. If I think something is stupid, like a stu uh, 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 something that people consider to be a best practice or it could be a Salesforce feature or functionality, many many people know that all you have to do is bring up the topic of multi-select pick lists or, or person accounts to me and my steam is going to start coming out of my ears and I'm going to go on a rant. Uh, but it doesn't even have to be about, uh, about the te Salesforce technology at all. It could be just about what 
excites you, what you happen to have experience in. It could just be about the way you put words together to explain complex concepts, but in a really simple and easy way. And you stand out just for that alone. So it, it could be anything. So you don't necessarily have to look for a way to stand out. And that, that's where it's a little bit of self-reflection that's needed for you to figure out what makes me, me. Not what makes me different from other people. What makes me, me. That's it. That's awesome advice. I'm uh, gonna put a, uh, another link um, in the chat. And this is to a resource that I created based upon my, my journey. Uh, a few years ago when I left the military with no background in Salesforce to um, to brand myself and to attract the attention of employers. And it, it you know, basically, uh, same exact thing that David is saying. Um, I chose social media as my primary platform uh, to get my brand out once I had figured out what my brand is. Um, and to David's point, you know, those unique characteristics about yourself that, that make you you and communicate value to employers. Um, and then I, I focused on kind of the, the triangle of, of profile, network, and content. So you got to have a great profile. It looks professional. Um, you have to have a large network um, that's relevant. So, you know, within the Salesforce ecosystem. Uh, and that's, and if you don't know what you want to do, great. Connect with everybody, developers, admins, consultants, hiring managers, you know, recruiting specialists, everybody, and anybody that's related to the Salesforce ecosystem, because you don't know where your next opportunity is going to come from or who's going to offer you that job. And then create content. You have to create content. David um, you know, has, I just looked at his LinkedIn page, th over 30,000 followers. And I, and I suspect, and he probably, you know, agrees that a lot, you know, that success is due in large part to the fact that he's a thought leader uh, through social media um, and posts regularly, creates original content regularly on the platform. And, you know, which is why people follow him. And so, you know, just to kind of, um, to put a bow on that before we get to Anthony's question, which I see in chat, Folks are like, well, you know, I know I have to create content, but I, I don't know what to create. I'm brand new to the ecosystem. What, what could I possibly, you know, add from a thought perspective that would enrich the community? And, and I would say everyone has something to offer. Um, and, and, you know, you have to approach it from a crawl, walk, run methodology. And when you're crawling, when you're just getting involved in the ecosystem, what's the best thing you can do? Ask questions. Any question you ask here, I bet you there's, there's tons of folks in the ecosystem on LinkedIn that would jump to answer that question. Um, and, you know, provide their perspective. And, and that's where I got started. I just started asking questions. And then eventually you learn enough to where you're like, okay, I know a little bit. And you can start um, kind of, I, I call it uh, resharing content. So you, you go out to Trailhead or you go out to an event or you find something that's interesting. Maybe it's release notes and you do a summary and you share that with folks. And that's kind of the, the, walk, the walk phase where you're, you're kind of regurgitating content that's already been created, but you're, you're, you're packaging it with your unique spin and you're sharing it with folks that probably don't have time to go find it themselves because they're busy. Um, and then, you know, when you graduate to the run phase, you're generating your own content. You know, you've, you've been in the ecosystem for a while, you've done some projects, you have thoughts and you're, you're sharing that. Maybe it's a, a YouTube video you created. Maybe you've created a, uh, an experienced cloud site and you want to share that. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're sharing that original content and you'll notice that as you go through this kind of uh, evolution, more and more folks will follow you. And then to David's point is exactly correct things just start kind of start happening. It's weird. Like opportunities come your way and it seems random, but it's not It's because you spent the time working on your profile, your network and your content. People identify you as a, you know, um, as a thought leader and they want to have you come speak to them. Um, and it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, thing to have happen. It just takes work. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you. So we'll get to we'll get uh, Anthony's question. Um, and Anthony asks in the chat, when you have never worked in Salesforce before, at what point do you have enough experience to actually start applying for jobs? This is a great question. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to answer the question by telling you about, <laughs> excuse me, uh, about my son, my 23 year old son about two years ago, no, a mm, year and a half ago. Uh, he, so my son, uh, lives in Israel. I'm in Northern New Jersey and he, up until recently, he decided that, uh, up until recently he wanted to pursue a career, uh, in the medical field. His goal was to be a surgeon. Um, he was 
in college and trying to figure out medical school options in Israel. And in the pandemic, I decided that I was going to offer my Salesforce admin bootcamp training online. And I turned to him and I said, listen, you're still trying to figure out what you want to do. My recommendation is just make the time to take this class. My goal is not to have you pursue a Salesforce related career at all. My goal is to give you an understanding, a baseline of how technology is used in companies, of basics of database architecture, even more so if you have an understanding of how Salesforce is used, chances are you're going to end up working, maybe it's in a hospital, maybe it's in a medical office, maybe it's in an insurance company. I don't know, but there's a good chance that the company at some point is going to be using Salesforce. You will have some basic rudimentary understanding of what Salesforce is about. Like that's it. My, the, the bar was very low. Anyway, um, he took the course and uh, he decided afterwards, or I should say while taking the course, he decided that he was super excited about all things Salesforce. And he decided to sit for the admin certification exam, uh, which he passed. And while he was taking the course, he was looking for some part-time job while he's in school in Israel, looking for a part-time job. And he was interviewed by some guys from uh, California who also moved to Israel and they do some, they're in the recruiting business uh, for uh, the healthcare industry back in California, very bizarre. But anyway, they were looking for a virtual assistant, a remote secretary, essentially. Uh, and they, so he was interviewing for this job and they happened to mention in conversation that they're using Salesforce. He got all excited. <laughs> so he's like, wait a minute. Did you guys just say you're using Salesforce? Like, that's crazy. Oh my God. I'm taking a Salesforce admin course right now to learn how to be an admin. These guys could not care less. They didn't even care that they had Salesforce. They didn't care that my son had any interest in Salesforce to them. That was like saying, yeah, and we happen to use Gmail for our email. They were like, whatever. Um, anyway, so he, he, he got the job. They basically wanted him to do things like once a week to start listing out all of the meetings that they have for the coming week. They wanted him once a week to start listing out all of the prospects that they need to follow up with. And as he's doing this, he's like, yeah, wait a minute. Can you do this in Salesforce? Like, I mean, you're showing behind the scenes how to set it up, but can you do this in Salesforce? Isn't this like out of the box Salesforce? I'm like, yeah, and here's how you do it. Uh, so I started explaining it to him and making it a little bit real. And he started implementing these things for them in Salesforce. And as he's uncovering more and more business requirements, day-to-day -day business operational things that they are trying to accomplish, he's realizing nine times out of 10, the answer is, this could be done in Salesforce. Why the heck are we using Google Sheets and Excel spreadsheets and all of these other manual rudimentary stupid ways of doing things when you could just do it in Salesforce? So he started doing all of these things even before he got certified. He weaseled his way in to get admin permissions in Salesforce. And he started doing all of these things in Salesforce. And then he turned to me and he's like, okay, tasks. How do you assign tasks to other people? I'm like, dude, how do you not know that? So. He then he really, he pointed out to me, they are all sharing one user. I'm like, oh well, all bets are off. So he was learning on the job, even though he was brand new to Salesforce. He was learning and he was not applying for a Salesforce related job. He was not looking to be a Salesforce admin. He was trying to help them as a virtual secretary uh, to run, help run the logistics of their business. As he was doing this, uh, he basically turned to them and like, okay, guys, you're on the, I don't even remember what it's, uh, essentials. They're on the essentials plan. And he's like, yeah, you need professional, at least professional. And based on all kinds of other things, you really need enterprise. And he convinced them to upgrade. And then he realized <laughs> that he 
Within six months, he realized he outgrew his job. They were no longer interested in him being responsible for Salesforce. They wanted him to do all kinds of other things. And he was like, that they just don't appreciate like what sales, how Salesforce can help them automate and streamline their business operations. They just want to do things in the rudimentary manual painstaking way that they have done it before. And he wanted to look for another job. So he got himself another job and now he's working for one of my competitors. And I actually introduced him to them uh, for one of my competitors in Israel as a Salesforce admin consultant. Um, so my point is anyone can learn Salesforce and anyone can get a job in the Salesforce ecosystem without even necessarily having the certification, without necessarily even having the hands-on experience. Look to your own strengths. What is it that you're capable of doing? Salesforce, at the beginning, Salesforce is on the periphery of your job. They just happen to be using Salesforce and you happen to be learning Salesforce. And as the match is there between your knowledge and expertise, your ability to help them, the problems that they have within the organization, go ahead and start demonstrating that on the job. And then you will start making your way to become a Salesforce admin or building your Salesforce career. It's a great story. And, and um, Angela, we've got time for one more question. Angela's got a, actually a related question in the chat. Uh, as a new person in the Salesforce ecosystem, do you think there's a benefit to being a solo Salesforce admin versus working as a Salesforce admin consultant? That is a fantastic question. So it's very challenging when you're new. It's very challenging to be a solo admin where you don't have who to turn to to ask questions. It could be for a lot of people, it's insanely stressful. So long as you are transparent about it at work, and you leverage the Salesforce community, you can be completely fine and it doesn't have to be a problem. Guess what? If you screw up, nobody's really going to know about it. I mean, they'll, they'll know eventually. It'll take time for them to realize like, oh, this doesn't work. It's not scalable. But if uh, you are proactively trying to identify what is the most appropriate way to solve for this problem on the Salesforce platform and implementing it, in the Salesforce platform and you're transparent about it of, okay, you, here's the problem that you have. I asked around and it looks like this is the best way to do it. I'm not claiming I've ever done this before, but I'm happy to do it for you. They're all humans. Your manager is a human. Everyone you're working with, they're human. So long as they are reasonable about it, it's not a problem. Uh, so yes, it's okay to do that, but it can be for some people, it is so insane, insanely stressful not to have that safety net, not to have the camaraderie of colleagues that you can turn to, to ask questions. So it really depends on your own personal comfort level. Uh, but you need to think of very often I were, I interact with, uh, solo admins at some pretty large organizations, solo admins where it was their first and only job doing anything Salesforce related. And through the user group meetups, through the online, any kind of webinars that are happening, through like the various Slack, uh, Slack workspaces that are available within the Salesforce ecosystem, through posts like my, my posts on LinkedIn or Twitter, they're able to ask questions and engage with other people to be the sounding board that they need to feel confident every day at the job. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, David. My pleasure. We are at time, um, exa exactly at time. So uh, we'll go ahead and close for this evening. But before we do, just wanted to thank David Giller for spending time to educate us about uh, the admin career path, all things admin, as well as the importance of end user training. So thank you so much, David. Thank you for having me. It was great being here. And by the way, if I did not have a chance to answer anyone's question, you can feel free to reach out to me through whatever communication channel you want, LinkedIn, Twitter, email, whatever. You can feel free to reach out to me and I'll do the best that I can to respond. Awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you to everyone that made time to attend tonight. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Um, and in the meantime, have a great rest of your evening and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks so much, everybody.